Okay, so again, um, today we're talking about what has happened to our country. This was the hardest lecture I have ever put together. I didn't sleep last night because there's so much missing from this because so much is happening so fast. And there's many things I won't be dealing with at all, but I'm going to deal with a couple things. Let's see what we got. So what has happened to our country? Inquiring minds want to know. Whatever it is, it's been a long time coming. A long time coming. Matthew 10, 16 says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the middle of, of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpent and harmless as doves. As unificationists and as teachers uh, like myself and Pastor Frank and several of us, uh, our responsibility is to make you aware of things that you may not, may or may not be aware of. And this is one of them. Um, the, the, the current uh, political, spiritual, moral uh, atmosphere of the country, there's something happening. Does anybody notice anything different in the last year or so? Anyone? No? Yeah. So I've spoken before about the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, right? That involves these guys. And this is a small fraction of that group. And I just want to talk about three of them. I'm not going to belabor something I've already talked about. But these three guys in particular uh, have set a lot of the spiritual foundation, actually, and uh, the, the, a lot of the corruption that is in America now at its, at its base. George Lukács from Hungary, Hungarian Marxist philosopher, literary historian, critic, and founder of the Frankfurt School. He is one of the founders of Western Marxism and contributed to Marxist theory with developments of Marxist theory of class consciousness. He ideologically developed and organized Lenin's ideas into the formal philosophy of vanguard party revolution. He said, I saw the revolutionary destruction of society as the one and only solution. A worldwide overturning of values cannot take place without the annihilation of the old values and the creation of new ones by the revolutionaries. That sounds pretty definitive. He's not playing around and he's very public about it. Very, very public about it. These guys are not afraid. They just tell you straight up what's going on. Antonio Gramsci. This is a very interesting guy. Now this is the Italian wing of the Communist Party. Uh, this is going to be somewhat of a history lesson. I hope everybody's <laughs> seat belts fastened, thinking caps on. It's not male, female hour and uh, true love and peace and love. There'll be some of that, but this is kind of raw history, okay? Antonio Gramsci is a seminal intellectual figure of international communism for several reasons. This one-time leader of the Italian Communist Party concentrated his energy not solely on theoretical and critical class warfare, but on culture. Communism, he fervently argued, must target what he called cultural hegemony. Gramsci's influence on Western atheism is particularly poignant, given that he embraced Marx's idea that the role of philosophy should be to change the world, not understand it. Action is what the world needs, Marxists contend, not philosophical reflection. Not philosophical reflection. Meanwhile, in Moscow, there's a plaque in his honor. The inscription reads, in this building in 1922-23 worked the eminent figure of international communism and the labor movement and founder of the Italian Communist Party, Antonio Gramsci. And seatbelts fastened, thinking caps on, he said this. Socialism is precisely the religion that must overwhelm Christianity. Must overwhelm Christianity. That means replace and destroy. In the new order, socialism will triumph by first capturing the culture by infiltration of schools, universities, churches, and the media by transforming the consciousness of society. This is the reason why I'm giving this sermon today. I could have given a thousand different things, but this has been disturbing me so terribly that I figured I have to say something. I cannot remain quiet. Roger Kiska, writing for Acton.org, writes, one of the underlying problems with this type of Marxism is that an attack on the family and the Judeo-Christian values that sustain it leads to catastrophic economic and social effects. For example, in 2014, former British welfare minister Lord David Freud suggested that the breakdown of the family in the United Kingdom would cost taxpayers an estimated 46 billion pounds. In America, 
the Brookings Institution's Isabel Sawhill calculated the breakdown of the family extracted $229 billion from U.S. taxpayers between 1970 and 1996. This figure includes the toll caused by teen pregnancy, crime, poverty, drug abuse, and health problems that have resulted from divorces or broken families. Benjamin Scafidi's 2008 study for the Institute of American Values found that divorce and out-of-wedlock childbirth cost the American people $112 billion each year. Each year. Pope John Paul II could not have been more correct when he called the natural family the building block of society. Pastor Frank says that every Sunday in this room. The family is the natural building block of society. Father's been teaching that pounds that like a nail. Every single time Father opens his mouth at Belvedere, it was always, we begin with Adam and Eve and the fall of man, the ideal of God, etc., etc., etc. And then he builds from there. Gramsci coined the term the long march through the institutions. But Rudi Dutschke, a German Marxist, put rockets on it and went nuts with it. To extend the base of the student movement, Rudi Dutschke has proposed the strategy of the long march through the institutions. He took the phrase and put wheels on it and made an ideology out of it. Working against the established institutions while working within them. In other words, infiltrating, being in them, but not of them. In them and not of them. And this is Herbert Marcuse, who I'm going to talk about next, re writes about him in Counter Revolution and Revolt in 1972. They will in infiltrate universities and schools, bureaucracies, media, and Hollywood. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Herbert Marcuse. Marcuse was a German-American philosopher, sociologist, and political theorist. Born in Berlin, Marcuse studied at the universities of Berlin and then at Freiburg, where he received his PhD. He was a prominent figure in the Frankfurt-based Institute for Social Research, which later became known as the Frankfurt School. In his written works, he criticized capitalism, modern technology, historical materialism, and entertainment culture, arguing that they represent new forms of social control. He was the major driving force behind the sexual revolution of the 60s. He taught at the University of California at San Diego from 1965 until his retirement. Right here in good old SD. He was one of the ringleaders. Later he summed up the entire cabal very well. Get ready for this. One can rightfully speak of a cultural revolution since the protest is directed towards the whole cultural establishment, including the morality of existing society. What we must undertake is a type of diffuse and dispersed disintegration of the system. This is out of his own mouth. This is not a right-wing conspiracy. I'm not making this up. He's advocating for the disintegration of Western democracies. Marcuse was a former student of future Nazi philosopher Martin Heidegger. This guy goes way back into Germany, uh, pre-Hitler. This guy had to escape Hitler. Hitler hated communists as much as he hated the Jews. Father of Deconstruction, a process by which every thought or writing from the past had to be examined and torn down as an outgrowth of its social milieu. Heidegger wasn't shy about his intentions. He longed for the moment when the spiritual strength of the West fails and its joints crack, when the moribund semblance of culture caves in and drags all forces into confusion and lets them suffocate in madness. I can't make this stuff up. And it's amazing that people think like this somewhere in the world. David Horowitz was a contemporary of Tom Hayden and Jane Fonda way, way back in the Black Panthers in the uh, 60s and 70s. He was kind of a bomb thrower with these guys. And he when the Black Panthers killed his best friend, <laughs> he had quite an epiphany. Lights went off. And he became a, a lifelong conservative after that. And he wrote a book, a very, very interesting book. I've got a copy of it right back under the printer, called The Professors. He said, the 101 most dangerous academics in America. He calls them dangerous. There's some really dangerous people. Ward Churchill, for one. Uh, there's, uh, uh, there's, just, there's a raft of them. There's 101 in here. And they're all on the hard left. How do you capture the thought of a nation? 
you capture the means of information. You capture the means of education and information. That's exactly what's happening. So, if you're listening to any of these guys, you're not going to get the truth. I've, I've done the deep dive on this. And these guys, I, I'm amazed. I find out what's actually happening, and these guys are either denying it outright or fabricating stories and presenting them to the public as truth. I've seen it a thousand times. I don't have time to go to all the ex examples of this going on. Now, for a little bit of evidence, <laughs> let's, let's have evidence in a court of law here. Here's exhibit A. Let's see if our sound's gonna work here. Here comes the sound. Uh, let's hope this thing fires up. No, of course not. Uh, try, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Wait. We have to pull the two plugs on the left there, the two, the, the keyboard plugs, in order to get sound. We gotta, no, no, these guys. Oh, yes. These guys have to come out like that. That's the only way it works. Sorry. Okay. It might, uh, pull down the volume a little bit until, because it might be loud. It sounds like it's going to be really loud. If you want to see what's happening on... This is Will Witt from Craig Review today. We're on Santa Monica Beach and we're going to be asking people some questions for the 4th of July. Why do we celebrate the 4th of July? Uh, I don't really know. Why do we celebrate the 4th of July? Um, celebrate the independence of our nation. Unfortunately, our cabling it doesn't allow us, the, the music over, over, overcomes the vocal. But he was asking them, what's the significance of 1776? Very few people knew what it was. Now these are people that are college age. It doesn't necessarily mean that they were turned down, all the way down. Um, doesn't mean they're in college. Probably a lot of them have gone to college, but they should know even from grade school what 1776 is. And that shows you the corruption in the education system. Every single American, those were Americans, and they should know the significance of 1776. This kind of societal reordering has been tried before. There's, there's, there's precedence. It's not like this hasn't been tried before. Right? In the French Revolution, under the banner of liberty, fraternity, equality, or death, liberty, fraternity, equality, or death. Well, they certainly stormed the Bastille, pulled down statues. Where have we seen that before? Oh, wait a minute. They're pulling down statues. Yeah, they tried that here. That's uh, Andrew Jackson. Just before the park police uh, pulled these people away, they were gonna jerk that one down. There goes Christopher Columbus, but just people who don't know any better. Yeah, Christopher Columbus had problems. Yeah, he, in fact, he paid for it too. He was taken back in chains back to Spain, all right? But do you know what Christopher Columbus' motivation was? A, a document was found in 1892, and I have it, I, again, in the, in the interest of time, and this kills me. I had to cut so much out of this for, for the interest of time. His underlying motivation for going to the New World was to spread the gospel of Christ. He was convinced that he was going to be the trigger for the second coming of Christ. Based on Matthew 24, 14. And he said, 
God showed him an enormous vision of the, uh, the, the, the word of God being exported out of Europe into the new world because the Bible says this gospel of the kingdom will be spread to all the world and then the end will come. He took that to heart. He took that as a personal mission. And as we know, fallen nature being what it, what it is, he went to the new world, exploited the Indians, got gold fever, taken back to Spain in chains, by the way. <laughs> and then our own patron saint of San Diego, this is Father Unipero Serra. He was the latest one to go. The father of the, of the mission system in California. So this is coming home. Be ready. This is coming to your school. This is coming to your job. It's already here. Again, I have tons of information and evidence of what's going on at the, at the grassroots. And I'm telling you, the mainstream media is not reporting it. They never report this stuff. Just like the French Revolution, these kind of things could be on the horizon. Maximilian Robespierre became one of the most radical leaders of the revolution. He whipped up a climate of fear and soon his opponents were being sent to the guillotine. Remember, this is under the guise of liberty, fraternity, and equality. Liberty, eternity, and for, uh, equality for one group of people that think like them. Estimates are as high as 40,000 people were killed during the 10-year period between 1789 and 99. He himself was seized and beheaded without trial in 1794. Now, the French Revolution is referred to historically as the Reign of Terror. The Reign of Terror. Fraternity, equality, liberty has become the Reign of Terror. The French Revolution succeeded in overthrowing a corrupt and unjust system of government, but it soon ran out of control. First, aristocrats were executed, then the revolutionaries turned on each other in a bloodbath. The Reign of Terror begun in which the state governed by fear. Even the the in, inherent left-wing movement in America is ferociously divided amongst itself. If any one of them takes power, they will destroy the other ones. It happens in every single Marxist takeover. Where does all this come from? The divine principle tells us. It's not my manufacturer. I can't make this up. I'm not that smart, quite frankly. But this goes all the way back to Lucifer versus God. This goes all the way back to Satan versus Adam. Cain versus Abel. Right? Cain kills Abel. What? Out of resentment, jealousy, and hatred. And God came to him and said, if you do well, will you not be accepted? He didn't come to Abel with that. The responsibility was with Cain. Cain has to do the right thing. Don't kill your brother. It only makes logical sense you don't kill your brother. You're the first brothers on earth. So this, the principle tells us that this Cain-type thought begins to descend through culture. Right? Ishmael and Isaac. Hebrew culture versus Arabic culture, and they're fighting to this day. The Jews and the, and the Muslims are still fighting. They don't, they, for some reason, they've completely lost the fact that they are brothers. They are sons of Abraham. They are sons of Abraham. Somehow, they've got to get back to sons of Abraham and break bread together. Somehow. How's that going to happen? So now, this Cain-type thought, Abel-type thought, it's coming down from the Renaissance to the Reformation in America, the Enlightenment. Nothing wrong with the Enlightenment. The, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment. Uh, uh, <laughs> the Renaissance and the Enlightenment brought us many, many things. Uh, that was the age of invention. All kinds of amazing ideas. Descartes came and all, kind, uh, high, uh, uh, all kinds of great thoughts and art and culture. But here in America and, and in Germany, the Reformation, the 1517, with uh, Martin Luther nailing his 95 Theses against the, the, the church door at Wittenberg, Germany. Then in America, that eventually descends 200 years later in the Great Awakening, the Wesley Brothers, the great Christian uh, revolution and uh, um, revival in America in the 1700s. The Enlightenment gives birth finally to the French Revolution in 1789, and at the same time, the Bill of Rights is uh, 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 ratified. It was ratified in 1789. Very interesting. Corresponding revolutions in exactly the same year. Shows that this is true. The divine principle is absolutely true. Who would figure this out but, but Sun Young Moon? 
And Father said he fought really hard for all this. It didn't just, just descend on him. And he talked about the fall of man. What did he say about that? Who did he fight? Satan directly. Directly. He felt like the, he said the, felt like the skin was ripping off my flesh. The force, the, the presence of Satan was so tangible and so horrible because Satan was so angry that he figured it out. So, now, this is just a little side fun thing. I called the uh, Sebastian Gorka show last year and I talked to him about this concept. Back then, his show had just launched <coughs> and uh, uh, it was very easy to get in. I've been on the show four times. I've recorded all of them. Now, it's like any big national show, you can't get in. The phone, he's got two million listeners at any given time and the phones are always jammed. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, sound. Let's see if we can get it. I hope this works. Wires are terrible. Oh. And by the way, <coughs> I call because <coughs> there's a, 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 a gun show uh, in Vegas called the SHOT Show. All the gun manufacturers and uh, uh, people go there for an exhibition. Justin Moon, father's son, is president and founder of Car Arms, which is now an advertiser on the Seb Gorka Show. <laughs> Just so happens. They made fast friends. So the next day, I saw the interview, and the next day I, I was just banging on that phone, getting into Seb Gorka, because I wanted to follow up, right? So now I made a mistake in here that I'm still kicking myself about. I told him, and you're going to hear it, but I want to explain it. I said that my first vote was for Jimmy Carter, and it was the last vote I ever cast. That's not, I was supposed to say the last Democrat vote I ever cast. With that in mind, we'll press on. I joined the church that his father started 42 years ago. Really? Yes. And uh, his father's son knew. And I'm going to tell you a know, very interesting quick story. I know you're pressing time. Well, got it. The first, the first vote I ever cast was for Jimmy Carter. And why? Because the media said he was a good Christian who prayed in Spanish. They did. They did. They said that, didn't they? Yeah. So that was the first and last vote I ever cast. Why? I joined the Unification Church uh, uh, in 77. Reverend Sun Young Moon and the Unification Principle is what turned me into a conservative. I understood conservatism from the perspective of the entire uh, panoply of the world. The history of the world boils down to Cain, Abel, and Seth. The Cain side is communism. The Abel side is democracy. The Seth side is the third world. Right? I hadn't heard that before. Did you know that in that church? That's, I, that's fascinating. I'm telling you, I hope you can hear the divine principle of teaching the church. You will be absolutely right on the number two. Go ahead. Point. Now, uh, the Supreme Court. I believe, and it may be all long before Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. Dossier, Ukrainian nonsense, the Democrats are pulling, are an attempt to keep Donald Trump from appointing another Supreme Court justice because they know. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is on her last leg. I've said this before. I don't think I came up with it. I think somebody at quarter suggested to Rush Limbaugh this is a very, very plausible scenario. That they know Ruth might be on her way out and they want to be able to say to the president and to America, I'm sorry he doesn't get to nominate his third Supreme Court justice. Why? Because he's under impeachment with John. I think that is a very, very likely scenario. And it shows you just how dastardly these people are. God bless you, God. I love that Old Testament analogy. I'm going to go home. I'm going to meditate on that. We're squeezing one more call. I'm good friend in Los Angeles. Brett. <laughs> so to go home and meditate on that. And I'm telling you, he is a former uh, security advisor to the president and is a world-renowned expert on subversion. And uh, he knows where all the bodies are buried all around the world. Who's who at the zoo? I mean, he knows like all the different terrorist groups, who are the leaders, what are they doing, where's their funding, where are their weapons, he, he knows all of that stuff. This is not a ding dong, right? So, does it stop there? No, it does not. It does not. 
This tumbles down now, hundreds of years later, into the 20th century. In 1917, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, better known as Lenin, promised the first truly free election in Russia. All votes would be equal. Lenin's Bolsheviks, the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, <laughs> promised peace, land, and bread. Liberty, fraternity, and equality. The promise was insufficient to win the election and the Bolsheviks received just 23% of the vote. So they just took the country over. And the Bolshevik Revolution started and worldwide communism was launched in 1917. Robert Conquest is the world's leading expert on the, the nation of Russia and the takeover of the Bolsheviks and the subsequent uh, Soviet Union of Soci Soviet Socialist Republics and everything they did. He's got an order of the British Empire, he's a friend of the British Academy, and he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in America. This is a very, very well-versed, very intelligent man. He said, and he's written 30 books, by the way, and said, historians estimate the total number of deaths due to Stalinist repression in 1937 to 38 to be between 950,000 and 1.2 million. That's just one year. One year. They went on to kill tens of millions more. Uh, Stalin starved 20 million Ukrainians. The Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe. It's called the, it's like the San Joaquin Valley in California. The Ukraine was the called the breadbasket of Europe. But 20 million people starved because of collectivist uh, uh, policies. This was tried in China, in the Cultural Revolution. Public shaming. Public shame. People were dragged out. If they were suspected to be an enemy of the state, quote unquote, they were dragged out, publicly ridiculed, sometimes uh, rocks and, and dirt and mud were thrown at them. Sometimes they would be shot and killed by the thousands. The lowball estimate of the death toll from the Cultural Revolution is 60 million people. 60 million people. Why do we not know about this? Again, the media is not going to tell you. In fact, the New York Times is famous for not reporting the atrocities of the Soviet Union. There's a litany of stories where they're glowing about the wonderful strides forward by, by uh, Joseph Stalin. They called him Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe Stalin. Okay, right. They tried this in Cuba with Castro. He never had a democratic election during his entire reign in Cuba. Uh, I wish I had the picture. I, again, I got to cut so much stuff out. At his funeral procession, they put his casket on the back of a jeep. And on the way to the cemetery, it broke down. It <laughs> broke down. How telling. It literally broke down and stopped running. East and West Germany tried the same thing with the Berlin Wall. Vietnam, same thing. The Chinese were supported by the Russians to try to take over Vietnam. They did. They chased us out in 75. It became communized. Now, like many, many uh, communist takeovers, they have a semblance of democracy, but it's still overlaid with a communist hierarchy and structure. It's still communist. There's a lot of stuff you can't do. <laughs> Don't whip out a Bible anywhere in Vietnam or China. And now in Venezuela. The most recent example is Venezuela. Once Hugo Chavez took over, by the time Maduro got in there, when Hugo Chavez died of cancer shortly after that, people were eating their pets. There was, I'm not making this up. There's news stories, again, you won't hear it from CBS. They will not report this stuff. They will not, because it doesn't fit the orthodoxy. It doesn't fit the orthodoxy. But people were eating their pets, and there was video of people chasing after trash trucks, trying to grab a few morsels out of a trash truck. Because collectivism doesn't work. Collectivism never works. How many have heard the bread lines in Russia un under the communist regimes? He was there. He saw it. Bread line, but the military gleaming bright. All the weapons you can shake a stick at. Gleaming missiles, plenty of AK-47 Kalashnikov rifles, MiG-22s, MiG-21s, MiG-23s going all over the world. But the people were starving to death. And that's happening in, in wherever Marxism takes over, death, destruction, disease, and poverty follows every single time. We have to be, again, 
wise as serpents and harmless as doves because this stuff is coming here now. Stephen Molyneux is an influencer on the web, has a huge following. I'll just play 30 seconds or so of this. This is scary, but he knows what he's talking about and there is precedent. So cancel culture is a dress rehearsal for Matt Wood. So I'd be very clear. Cancel culture is a dress rehearsal for mass murder. They're seeing if people can be disappeared from social media, and if people accept people being disappeared from social media, then they will accept people being disappeared from the world. When communists get into power, when socialists get into power, they kill us. No kidding, no fooling, and our families are lucky to get away. Yeah, yeah, we'll break you forward up the cliff. Cancel culture is a dress rehearsal for extermination. Yeah, listen, they call it character assassination. For a reason. Because it's a rehearsal, right? It's a rehearsal. And the kind of lies that are told about me uh, in the mainstream media, in uh, Wikipedia and, and other places, they're very specifically designed to get crazy people to target me in a violent way. This is happening all over the country. Uh, there's a journalist named Andy No, gay Asian Democrat, reporting on the activities of Antifa, has almost been killed twice. Uh, they hit him with a what's called like a concrete shake. I forget what it's called. There's a name for it. Uh, sent him to the hospital with a brain hemorrhage, and they just beat him up again. He just wrote a book about Antifa. Uh, they protested at a store it was being sold at. They forced him to take it out. Uh, again, this is happening all over the country. Now, here's an example for me. I posted on Facebook a picture uh, after Kamala Harris's visit to Guatemala. This is what it looks like now. Guatemala protesters greet Kamala Harris. Mark Alexander and David Frank gave me thumbs up on this one. <laughs> what was that picture? This is the picture. Guatemalans visited her with Trump signs telling her, Kamala, mind your own business. Kamala, go home. And Trump won. Even many of them feel that Trump won the election. Now, when you click on the link, this is what you get. That picture's been expunged from YouTube, that video. It says, it says the video has been removed by the uploader. It never happens like that. It's YouTube. They have to say that. If they say it's removed by YouTube, they're responsible for it. This is how they cover their tracks. It wasn't removed by the uploader. The uploader uploaded it. Why would he take it back? YouTube is spiking it. This is my kickoff of Twitter in 2019. This was after now AOC, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is in the, in the thread on this, this uh, twit, the tweet. They were complaining about not being able to go to Israel to visit the nation of Israel. The Prime Minister invited the American Congress persons to come to Israel to visit, come visit. The squad, AOC, Ariana, uh, uh, Ayanna Presley, uh, Ilhan Omar, and uh, Rashida Tlaib didn't go. Why? Because ev eventually the Prime Minister said, they knew very well what they were gonna do. They were gonna protest on the, on the, in Palestine, right? So I said, and everybody was all outraged. Oh, they didn't go. Well, they didn't go. They were invited. They didn't want to go because they wanted to do their own thing. The government didn't want them to go breaking off in their own thing and start raising all kinds of hell in Israel. So I said, when are you going to have the same outrage over the many Muslim nations that regularly stone women? And do they? It takes a 30-second Google search. Women caught in adultery are buried up to their necks, and their, stone, their head is stoned by the men in the village, wherever the village is. They're stoned to death. They cut their clitorises. In, in Sharia law countries, in Saudi Arabia, women, there's a ritual, it's called a clitorectomy. Their clitorises are cut off at 15 years old, much like men have a circumcision. But without going into graphic detail, that is about the worst thing you can possibly do to a woman. Many people do this in the United States. And there are movements beginning to, to to surface, but they want to outlaw this. It's brutality. It's absolutely, I don't care, religious or not, it's brutality. Throw, they throw gays off of buildings. 
uh, again, I could have shown video. I, in the interest of time and all that, uh, they, in certain Muslim countries, if you're found to be gay or in the act or assumed, they will throw you off of a building. And there's reams of video about that. In Saudi Arabia, women cannot work, cannot go to school, and they cannot drive a car. They can't even be in public without somebody in their family escorting them, and they're covered from head to toe in a burqa. Right? When? As soon as I hit the enter key, I was off Twitter with no recourse. As soon as I hit, they had the algorithms tightened down so tight on me, and they consider this hateful conduct. All of this can be proven in a 30 second Google search. I appealed, they said no. I've been off of Twitter ever since. This is happening in the United States of America. And I'm just one example. I sent this to Sebastian Gorka. When I told Sebastian Gorka this happened, he said, send that to me. And he was instrumental in Trump signing the Religious Freedom Act that came after that. He was gathering these from the whole country and then presented to Trump and Trump signed the Religious Freedom Act. Like you can't persecute people because of what they say. Now, Black Lives Matter. This has to be dealt with because now you're seeing, and you're gonna see this in the, in the very near future. It's, it's already here, it's in full bloom. It's critical race theory. And this is an outgrowth of the Frankfurt School. Um, this started, uh, uh, Patrice Cullors is the, is kind of the de facto media leader of it right now. And there's a whole story behind that. This started in July 2013, right after the Trayvon Martin uh, shooting and the, Mar the Michael Brown shooting. Black Lives Matter happened right in the middle of that. Now, there's a lot of lead up here. I don't have any way to shorten this. There's a whole, it's about a minute of lead in. It's, it, he's on a, uh, she's on a uh, uh, podcast and the guy is asking her a question. Many people are fearing that Black Lives Matter will just fade away what are the guarantees that it won't? Uh, and, and so a guy is leading into asking, like clarifying, please tell us what is your plan to keep Black Lives Matter going? Let's see if this works. He was concerned or is concerned that... Because uh, I want you to hear this out of her own mouth. Don't think that I'm inventing this. ...in Black Lives Matter that would allow it to be, to, to, to fizzle out, to, as he said... Uh, I can't move it forward. ...to Occupy Wall Street. Uh, as you are, are advanced in your own organization, as you all are headed to Cleveland to participate in this Black Lives uh, Movement conference, how do you respond to that particular critique? Again, a lovely critique from an elder in the struggle uh, that some others share, uh, that I've even shared as well, to, to be frank, as a concern about, uh, in part because of the co-optation and, and the appropriation, that, that a, a, a more clear ideological um, structuring might be of some value here. But how do you respond to, to, to those kinds of, uh, again, loving criticism? Um, I think that the criticism is helpful. Um, I also think that it might, um, I think of a lot of things. The first thing I think is that we actually do have an ideological frame. Um, myself and Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, we uh, are trained Marxists. Um, we are uh, super uh, versed um, on sort of ideological theories. Out of her own mouth, we are Marxists. And on their website, one of their goals is to dissolve the traditional American family and pretty much make it go away. That's where all this comes from. Again, you're not going to hear this on the mainstream media. I don't have time to go into Antifa, etc., but this was a combined BLM Antifa uh, activity in La Mesa. This is what's left of my bank in La Mesa. Last May, they burnt this bank down and the Chase Bank right next to it. George Floyd protest. It started out innocently enough as a kind of a peaceful protest at the police station. As night fell, cars began coming in from LA, out east, and everywhere else but San Diego. And they started breaking. They broke into the Walmart. They looted um, the uh, Vaughn Center and burnt down both of these banks to the ground. 
So this is serious business. It's, I said, it's coming to your school. It's coming to your city. It's coming to your job. Pressure, downward pressure is happening. Remember who Karl Marx was. He said, I wish to avenge myself against the one who rules above. Richard Wormbrandt wrote a book called Marx and Satan. Bill Starr was leader in Arizona. I don't know if he'll even remember this. It's so far back in the 80s. I read this book and I appealed to him. I said, Bill, let's buy 25 copies of this and, and send it to our ministers. And he agreed, let's do it, let's do it. We got 25 copies and I still have one left. I've got one left. But it's the most chilling thing to, it's largely correspondence between him and his family and him and his contemporaries. This was a deeply, deeply, profoundly disturbed man. I put forth that if Christians need any more signs from heaven about the mark of the beast, Revelation 13, 16 talks about a mark in the hand and in the forehead, not on. Many Christians say, oh, you're going to get a stamp, or you're going to get a chip. Yeah, it's going to be really obvious. No, it's not. The Bible says that Lucifer, Satan, is this most subtle beast of the field. The subtle beast of the field. The mark in the hand, hammer and sickle, one for each hand. Karl Marx. Hello, Marx. I mean, uh, Christians' red lights should be going off. Neon signs should be going off. All the signs are there. Mark in the forehead. In the forehead. What's in your forehead? Anybody want to venture a guess? Brain. Brain. What's in your brain? Thought process, what you think, what you feel, what you believe. Marxist Leninism. The red dragon that sits on many waters, red square, red China. Hello, Christians. Is anybody home? Both of his daughters committed suicide. The fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. Jenny and Laura, when they felt that they had helped the revolution enough, killed themselves. I'm going to skip this. This is a, this, the next slide. We're almost near the end. Uh, is a black leader who started a BLM chapter in St. Paul, Minnesota. Within two years, and he was out there with the fists and the, and the bullhorns and throwing stuff and blah, blah, blah. And he completely left it and started his own organization, which directly took donations from the public to help actual black families. And he, he completely disavows and, and left the organization. I'll, I'll skip that because it's a couple minutes long. Now, again, I don't have time to go into the other attack on our culture. Did you hear about Drag Queen Story Hour? Anybody? Oh, yes. This is happening in your, in your libraries and schools. It happened in Chula Vista. It's happening all over the country. These are men, men dressing up as very freaky women and teaching preschoolers God knows what. Here's your latest Kellogg's cereal box. On the back it says that you can have a fluid gender. Telling you how to, how to pick your gender on the back. There's, there's so much on this too. I, I, I just don't have time. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Who could have anything against Tony the Tiger and Toucan Sam? After all, right? And if you want to discover who's behind all of this, who's, who's financing all of this stuff, George Soros. You go to discoverthenetworks.org, put in the name George Soros, and you will be shocked. He actually has said on record that he considers himself the Messiah and that he is going to mold the world in his own image. He has a fortune of $28 billion, and he's funding 195 communist front organizations including the Tides Foundation, which, <laughs> but go to discoverthenetworks.org, look up George Soros, and be shocked. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they shall heap themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Nikita Khrushchev said, we cannot expect the Americans to jump from capitalism to communism, but we can assist their elected leaders in giving Americans small doses of socialism until suddenly they awake to find they have communism.
That's how it works everywhere. What's the hopeful side? The hopeful side is people are fighting back. Governor Ron DeSantis has signed a bill yesterday requiring that high school students be taught about the evils of communism. And he has authorized prayer in schools once again. Mandating schools teach the evils of communism and totalitarian ideologies. This man, I had no idea. His curriculum vitae is a mile long. Ex-SEAL Team 1 leader, lieutenant, and he has got medals yeah, like that. I had no idea until I did the deep dive on him. Eminently qualified for his position and maybe something beyond. This is a brief clip. Uh, I won't play the whole thing. This is another uh, case of people fighting back in New York. Good evening. My name is Tatiana Ibrahim and I'm here for the first time. I'm here tonight not only as a community member but as a parent in this district. A hundred parents appear at this meeting. sent out a survey wanting to know why parents were not voting yes for this budget. So my, my situation, my vote for no is a little different. I think the Board of Education and those sitting on the panels are thieves. I think they're liars and have committed treason against our children. My message to this district and the members of the Board of Ed, stop indoctrinating our children. Stop teaching our children to hate the police. Stop teaching our children that if they don't agree with the LGBT community, that they're homophobic. You have no idea each child's life. You don't know what their family lifestyle consists of. You don't know the makeup of their, of their life. You have children like mine who is Muslim and I'm Christian and everyone would think they would never believe that of her, right? And then we've got Larry Kudlow's show. This is a really interesting video that is going crazy viral. Critical race theory in really every aspect of American life. Now people are starting to wake up to it and stand up to it including, and you've got to look at this carefully, watch this father-daughter duo who made a video explaining why it does not work. Check this out. How we treat people based on who they are and not and what color nice. they are. And if they're nice, it's mm -hmm. See, this is, how, this is how children think right here. Critical race theory wants to end that. Not with my children. It's not going to happen. But we need to stop CRT. Period. Point blank. Children do not see skin color, man. They love everybody. Boy, every then he talks to he talks to uh, Ben Carson as well, who does this, says the same thing. <laughs> I don't have time to go into Antifa again. The things are coming so fast and furious. I can't possibly get to everything. Uh, the country has taken a really uh, dark turn to the left in the recent uh, year. Uh, People say, oh, Antifa is just an idea. It's, uh, Jerry Nadler said, oh, it's just an idea. They're a loosely connected. No, they're a hardcore organization. They are called the Black Bloc. They are 70 years old. They came under Hitler's Germany. They escaped from Hitler's Germany and exported themselves here. The reason why you see them all dressed in black is because they're following the German standard. They're called the Black Bloc for a reason. And interestingly enough, they're all white people. <laughs> So there's a, uh, there's a resurgent communist party in America. It's not a game, it's not a joke, it's not a right-wing fantasy. It actually has organization and power. They can put a thousand people in the street on a moment's notice. So what did Father, what are we supposed to be uh, 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 accomplishing? Father says we need to be fruitful. We need to grow to individual perfection. We need to unite mind and body. We need to multiply perfected people onto the family level. And we need to dominate the world with God's love. That's the goal. We don't get sidetracked attacking any group of people. It's not the, the ideal for white people. It's not the ideal for Asian people. It's not the ideal for Hispanic people. It's the ideal for everyone. Everyone is a child of God. By your DNA, you're a child of God. 
Nothing can take that from you. N no KKK, no white supremacist, no BLM person, nobody can take that from you. You're a child of Almighty God and you have a responsibility to try as hard as you can to realize the three blessings. That wasn't supposed to go twice. So, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's it. A little heavy, but... Uh, <laughs>